All right. The 12 o'clock mark has hit, and we are going to go ahead and get started. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Tammy. I am the health equity manager here at HQI. Before we get started, I'll just go over a couple of logistics. If you have a question, please click on the chat icon and enter your question there. Um, towards the end of the session, you can also raise your hand um, and ask your question verbally. And if you need to adjust your audio, you can click on the carrot next to the mute icon. And finally, um, all of the resources that we share on today's call will be available afterwards. All right, welcome to learning session three of our health equity work group. Thank you for joining. Um, today we'll be focusing on the CMS screening for social drivers measures. In the first part of our session, we'll be going over the measure requirements and timelines, um, as well as the steps to implementing screening. And then I'll be handing it off to my colleague, Catherine Zapik, to review some lessons learned in implementing screening from the Accountable Health Communities work. And just a reminder that this learning session will be followed up by the Health Equity Huddle on May 2nd. Okay, so in alignment with the Biden-Harris executive order to advance racial equity, CMS issued the fiscal year 2023 IPPS and LTEC final rule, establishing new requirements that build on key priorities to better measure healthcare quality disparities. Three measures were finalized under the hospital IQR program, and today we'll be talking about both the screening for social drivers of health measure and the screen positive rate for social drivers of health. So first we have the screening for social drivers measure. Both this and the following one really focus on identifying health related social needs or HRSNs. So this measure looks at the rate of inpatient admissions for patients who are 18 and over um, who have been screened for all of the five HRSNs, food insecurity, housing instability, transportation needs, utility difficulties, and interpersonal safety. And here is the next measure, the screen positive rate for social drivers of health. This looks at the percent of patients 18 and over who were admitted for an inpatient hospital stay, screened for the HRSNs, and were positive for one of the five HRSNs listed below. So quite similar to the last measure, but this time really focusing on how many patients um, actually screened positive for these social needs. So this is how the measures will be calculated. Both will be reported by submitting a numerator and a denominator. For the screening for social drivers measure, the numerator is the number of patients admitted for an inpatient stay who were screened for all of the five HRSNs during their stay. And the denominator is the total number of inpatients who were admitted for an inpatient hospital stay. For the screen positive rate for social drivers of health, the numerator consists of the number of patients admitted for an inpatient stay who were screened for all five of the HRSNs and who screened positive for one or more of those HRSNs. Then the denominator would be the number of patients admitted who were screened for all five of those HRSNs. Um, and for the screen positive rate, um, that it's important to note that five separate rates will be calculated. So there will be one for food insecurity, one for housing instability, one for transportation needs, and so on and so forth. So the following patients will be excluded from the denominator, those who opted out or declined to screen, as well as patients who are themselves unable to complete the screening during their inpatient stay and don't have a legal guardian or a caregiver able to do so on the patient's behalf. So 
So here are some details about how these calculations will be submitted. So hospitals will use their CCN to report this data through the hospital quality reporting system or the HQR system. Um, and the requirement is to report the aggregate numerators and denominators for both of these measures. Then the HQR system will calculate the rate for each measure based on those aggregates that you inputted. Um, and the screening for social drivers of health measure will be calculated as one rate, and the screen positive measure will be five rates, as we talked about earlier. And this data will not be publicly reported. So both the screening for social drivers and screen positive measure are voluntary to report in calendar year 2023, but will become mandatory in 2024. So if you choose to report for this year, 2023, the dates to include in that reporting would be from January 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023. Um, and because these measures are currently voluntary, they will not impact payment for fiscal year 2025, but they will impact fiscal year 2026 payment once they do become mandatory. And reporting will open up on April 1st, 2024, um, and must be submitted by May 15th. So now we're going to walk through how we actually uh, implement this process of implementing the social determinants of health screening. Um, and we're going to walk through five main steps. We'll start by dis discussing creating um, an SDOH team, then identifying goals, creating a plan, thinking about key considerations and talking through workflow planning, what it looks like to train staff. And then finally talking about using the PDSA cycle to roll out and revise the plan as necessary. So we'll start with creating a team. Creating a team starts with identifying champions. Champions are important because they can direct efforts to start and or improve existing social determinants of health data collection processes. So the project champion can be the point of contact working directly with staff to implement the data collection and action and oversee all implementation activities at their organization. The clinician champion can support the project champion with all of the social determinants of health activities, actively encouraging plan adoption among fellow providers, and answering any questions as needed. And one person can act as both of these roles if necessary. It's also important to ensure that the champions are given dedicated time for these efforts, and that may mean renegotiating responsibilities in order to prioritize this work. So next we have identifying goals. Consider how you want to use the data when choosing target patients, your SDOM measures, and other clinical goals related to the social determinants. Your screening goals will be driven by what makes sense for your organization and how you want to use the data. So food insecurity, housing instability, transportation needs, utility difficulties, and interpersonal safety are all required measures to screen for and your hospital can consider other measures, screening for other measures based on your knowledge of your community's needs. So the next question to think about would be, which patients will you screen for and how often? You wanna make sure to start small, start by screening a small group of patients, then scale upwards once workflows are working well. You can choose a target population based on easy to identify visits, such as routine surgeries or patients coming in for labor and delivery. This will help staff identify which patients to screen and help you track your success at screening your target patients. When creating these goals, be sure to get specific. Think about in the first six months, what percentage of targeted patients do you want to be screening for? In the first 12 months, what do you want that percentage to be? And eventually being able to move towards screening for 100% of patients. And then finally, consider how the data will be collected via paper format, electronically in the patient portal, 
when the patient comes in um, and how will that data be used? Will you give the patient a resource list, make referrals to social services, and so on. So we'll go a lot more in depth about how we can create this plan in the next few slides. So we're gonna review five different pieces to creating a plan, starting with selecting a screening tool, some things to consider for that, designing workflows, documenting and tracking data, creating a referral process, and finally training staff. So these are some questions to consider when selecting a screening tool. You want to think about what issues impact your communities the most. Aside from the required measures, you can utilize your community health needs assessment, as well as your quarterly disparities reports to decide on the measures that feel most important to ask your patient populations. Um, and then your EHR may have integrated SDA, an integrated SDA screening tool, which is always a place to start. So for instance, several common EHRs include templates with a few basic questions related to housing, education, employment status, um, and other social needs factors. So these are the kinds of tools that can be used to document these needs and communicate them to other members of the team. Okay, so here is a comparison chart of various screening tools your organization can choose from. Um, comparison charts like these can be really helpful in determining which tool will work best for your organization. Here you can think about the number of questions that you want to ask, and this can be dependent on the amount of time you want patients to spend on these screening tools. Um, one thing to also note here is that you don't have to use all of the questions that a screening tool provides. For example, some of these tools ask questions beyond social needs, so those don't need to be included in your uh, particular questionnaire. You can kind of pick and choose what works best for your organization and what's most relevant to you. Some other items to consider when selecting a screening tool include what population you want to gear your questions towards, the reading level, whether it's available in additional languages, and the other social, social needs that you want to ensure it covers. So this comparison chart looks at the five required social needs um, that CMS is requiring, and you can also create a chart with additional domains of your interest that's based on what works for your pop patient population. So we're going to move on to designing a workflow. And so when doing this, you want to make sure to think about the social needs, uh, that the social needs screening doesn't interrupt the patient um, experience. So you want to aim for minimal disruption by considering how social, how your social needs screening will impact the flow through the space, including how easy it is for the patient to get to from one point to another. And you want to avoid, for example, having the patient retrace their steps back to the waiting room just to complete the, the screening questionnaire. You also want to think about the um, additional time that's required for screening. Um, aim for the screening to be brief. It's recommended to be about 10 minutes or less um, and not impact the patient's time with the provider. You also want to consider what would be the best space for screening. Because these are sensitive questions that we're asking, aim to use a private area and create a respectful and safe environment for patients to answer these questions. Um, and it's also important to provide um, appropriate accommodations for your patients, um, specify procedures for providing accommodations for people with disabilities, for example, um, or translation services for non-English speakers. So now we're gonna walk through a workflow planning tool that will assist in this design. You wanna begin by determining where the screening will happen. Screening can occur at registration, at bedside, or right at discharge. And next, determine who will conduct the screening. So will it be registration staff, medical assistants, other members of the clinical team, it can be social workers and case managers. There are lots of options for who can conduct this screening, and it's going to be up to your organization to determine what works best for your personal workflow. 
Um, then the next question is to think about who will be providing these resources to patients who screen positive and agree to receiving these services. Um, so this can be through a printed list of resources. That list can be general or more tailored to patient specific needs that can be given to the patient at discharge or mailed to their address. Um, you can also connect patients to hospital staff who are more equipped to provide these resources, such as those uh, community health workers or case management. So the next question to consider in planning this workflow is who will provide information and make connections to community resources, which can again be registration staff, members of those clinical teams, um, or social workers and case managers. Then as we discussed earlier, really honing in on those social needs you want to screen for, there are of course the five required um, social needs that you have to screen for, and these are some examples of some other options that you can choose to include in your questionnaire based on what is more prominent in your uh, patients' communities. And then um, the last question here is to think about where in your facility will you screen? Um, where will you start that screening? Where will you start small? Um, and this can be all units, all inpatients. You can start with a specific unit and specific inpatients of a certain age. There is a lot of options here with where you can begin um, and where you can uh, get into that targeted group before scaling upwards. So here are some examples of how that workflow can come to life. And it's really important to remember here that this requires clear guidelines on roles and responsibilities. And so examples of what team members and their responsibilities can look like include the receptionist, the medical assistants, other registration staff um, can distribute the screening tool to patients upon arrival and make education materials available in those waiting areas such as pamphlets and brochures and flyers, those can be made available in, in those waiting areas. Nurses, physician assistants, or other healthcare educators um, can review the completed screening tool and determine patients' needs and what resources are available. And they can help counsel those patients during the visit and assist with documentation and follow-up. The physician may review the completed screening tool and action plan and incorporate it into the overall plan of care for the patient and then refer those patients to other team members for education as needed. Administrators can ensure adequate, adequate resources and staffing for screening, communicate those responsibilities, and ensure to provide training um, and education to staff about these responsibilities. And then if you have social workers or community health workers available, they can help determine the resources that are currently available in your communities and help complete that action plan prior to the patient's visit. They can facilitate referrals to community resources based on patient needs, as well as conduct any case management and follow up between those patient visits. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about documenting and tracking SDAW data. Um, once a team member has collected the data, it should be documented and recorded in the patient's EHR. And this data may be documented in the problem or diagnosis list, the patient or client history, or provider notes. Um, Z codes are uh, ICD 10 CM codes ranging from Z55 to Z65. Um, and these codes can be used to document this SDAW data because they refer to needs like housing, food insecurity, transportation, and others. And care teams may collect more detailed SDAW data than current Z codes allow for, meaning that other social needs beyond the ones that are covered under the Z codes can be documented in the patient's medical record. So Z codes can be assigned based on self-reported data and information documented by any member of the care team if their documentation is included in the official medical record. 
So the AHA coding clinic clarifies that um, any clinician can document a patient's social need with clinician referring to anyone deemed to meet the requirements set by regulation or internal hospital policy to document in the patient's official medical record. So patient self-reported documentation can also be used as long as that information is signed off and incorporated into the medical record by either a clinician with that broader definition or a provider. So coding pro professionals um, also play an essential role in ensuring the information documented in the patient's chart is coded accurately and should refer to the ICD-10-CM guidelines as well as AHA's coding clinic for updated guidance and examples. And coding managers should periodically review Z code data for consistency and quality and provide any necessary feedback. Um, we talked a little bit in the last huddle about encouraging coders to use Z codes. And one of the ways to do that is by sharing the why and explaining the importance of this work, not only to bettering health outcomes for patients, but also the potential of lowering, lowering healthcare costs when we adequately, adequately document, track, and address social needs. So once you've been able to collect and document your patient social needs, the next step is addressing those needs. So this can be done by making referrals in which there are three approaches. Referrals can be direct, where the organization directly contacts the service agency on behalf of the patient. They can be specific to community-based organizations, or you can provide a list of resources as we discussed earlier. You want to ensure a closed bi-directional process, which means following up with patients to make sure they received the referral and determining if they need any additional services as well. So keep in mind that patients may have multiple needs, so it's important to confirm with them if there is one they would like to prioritize for receiving assistance over others. Make sure to leverage the expertise of others who specialize in meeting these needs for different patients, such as those social workers and community health workers, and develop a database that your organization can continually update and refer back to to provide the most efficient care to patients. So we're going to talk about how we can develop a great community resource database. So as we talk about these resource lists, I want to provide some options for putting these lists together. So they can be created in a binder or spreadsheet, but keep in mind that since those are not automatically documented, it will be the responsibility of a staff person to upkeep and maintain those lists. You can include the list in your EHR for referrals which may be useful if your staff already know how to use the preference lists, and this method enables EHR-based tracking. You can also contract with other organizations that provide these lists, and this allows the list to be updated for you, although there may be a cost associated with contracting these organizations. So how do we get started in creating these lists? You have to first identify organizations um, in your community, trusted organizations, um, where you can refer patients to for identified social needs. Um, so if you are not already aware of some local community resources, these are some places to start. There's the 211 Helpline Center, Dialing 211 gives callers information and referrals about local social services. And this is available in all 50 US states. And the 211 website also provides um, information by zip code, and it's accessible in over 100 different languages. Um, Aunt Bertha has a free online directory of community resources that is searchable by zip code. There's also Benefit Finder, um, which is a tool that can help you find benefits and services that patients may be eligible to receive. And then we have the Social Vulnerability Index Toolkit, which we've talked about in previous sessions, um, that provides a starter list of community resources that can help address patients' challenges specific to different areas such as housing, socioeconomic status, disability, and some other social needs.
So once the workflow for screening has been completely laid out, the next step is to train staff. So here are some key topics you want to make sure you're including in that staff training. First is an overview of the training program, talking about the significance of addressing HRSNs, including the why of why your organization is screening. We want to walk through the screening workflows, which includes um, determining patients' eligibility, engaging the patients, obtaining consent, conducting the screening, how, how staff are to document their responses, and how they are to offer those referrals to community resources. You also want to make sure to include um, data collection and privacy. So walking through with staff on um, those data systems and community protocols or security protocols. Um, you also want to talk about communication skills. So what skills are necessary for engaging these patients positively in these screenings. Um, providing a script is really useful, a tailored script to introduce screening to patients. And finally, talk about common challenges um, in implementing screening and some mitigation strategies. So for example, in the script, you might want to include some examples of pushback you might get from patients and some mit mitigation strategies for how staff should respond to that pushback. So some other considerations for training um, include that the training should describe that importance of the HRSNs and explain why your organization is enga engaging in this screening. Um, review each question in the screening tool with your staff to ensure that the staff understand the purpose of each question and can answer any questions from patients that may come up in the future. And remind staff that patients can refuse to answer any of the questions. It's also important to accommodate various learning styles of the staff, so you can provide different modes of training, including in-person presentations, pre-recorded or live virtual events, written materials, videos, interactive trainings, and discussions. And lastly, one thing that I think is really important is to archive these trainings um, so that they're on demand to help facilitate training of new staff, as well as provide a type of resource bank for existing staff to currently or to, to be able to refer back to. And it's also helpful to think ahead and develop a process for new staff to shadow and practice screening with existing staff. So once the screening process and trainings have been designed, the next step is to make a plan of action to be able to roll out this entire process of screening from beginning to end. And this can be done using the PDSA cycle, which we've talked about in previous sessions. Um, and I think it's a really great tool, especially here to be, be able to use that in implementing these screenings. So the three main questions that guide this cycle are, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in an improvement? So the first step of this cycle is plan, uh, which begins by determining an objective. Um, so you can consider, is this plan testing how data is collected? How long patients take to complete the screening tool? Questions like that. So you want to state the question you want to answer and make predictions on what you think might happen. Um, think through who will be involved, what change are we looking to make, when will the change happen, and where will it occur. Be sure to identify any data you may need to collect and what the plan for data collection and analysis is. Next, you wanna carry out the plan by running the test on a small scale. While testing, capture any observations and describe what happened. What data did you collect? What observations did you make? Continue to collect the data and then begin analyzing it. Then the next step is to study. Study involves analyzing the results and comparing them to your uh, predictions. So here you are to analyze the data as a team and summarize and reflect on what you learned. And then the final step of this PDSA cycle is to act. So there are three possible routes to move forward. You can adapt by making modifications and running another test. If the test was successful, you may want to adopt it and move on to pushing it to a larger scale. 
or if it wasn't at all successful, the best option might be to abandon the test and start fresh. Um, and once you've decided on the next course of action, you can prepare a plan for the next PDSA cycle. And again, you want to go back to defining what this PDSA cycle will be related to, defining that objective type as well as the objective. So one thing to note is that the PDSAs are continuous. They're intended to help you plan each step of an improvement or a change over time. And keep in mind that each one also often contains a single step of an entire tool implementation. So it's really just one step at a time. And each cycle should be brief, allowing you to uh, gain knowledge um, on whether the, the process is working or not and make changes along the way. So we're going to walk through a sample PDSA cycle for um, implementing social determinants of health screening. Um, so here is a, a, a sample PDSA for um, implementing screening using EPIC um, that we're going to walk through together. So it starts with plan, which is identifying the question, predicting the results, and determining what data and how the data will be collected. So the question here is, how long will it take to enter screening results into the workflow? It was predicted that entering the results would take eight minutes. And so the data that they need here is the time needed to screen patients and the time needed to enter the results into the flow sheet. So they've listed that the medical assistants will be the ones to collect both pieces of this data here. So next we move on to the do cycle, which is carrying out the test and listing any observations. So here the observation is um, that entering the screening results into EPIC took an average of two minutes per screening. Then the next step is to study where we summarize what was learned, understand our results, and compare them to our predictions and identify any new questions or issues. So in the example here, they learned that entering screening results did not take as long as expected. And additionally, some patients did not want assistance despite reporting social needs challenges. So ultimately, entering the screening results um, resulted in no significant time burden. However, through this process, um, a new question arose related to tracking patients who declined that uh, social needs assistance, um, naming that someone should follow up with these patients at their next visit, um, and that their organization needs to update their external resources. So this last step is to act and determine what the next step will be based on what was learned. So here they will continue entering the screening into EPIC as well as update their external resources. And the next PDSA cycle will involve tracking those patients who decline social needs assistance. So you can see through this example how um, the PDSA cycle really allowed this organization to sort out one issue, which was the time for entering the screening results, and also brought to light another issue of interest that they're, that they're then going to dig into further. So in summary, there are many steps involved with implementing this screening, um, but with the right team and motivations, this important work can get done. So we reviewed how to create um, an SDAW team, how to identify goals, the best approach to selecting a screening tool and designing a workflow. We talked about best practices for documenting and tracking data, how to make those referrals and community resource lists um, and connect patients with those resources. And finally talked about using the PDSA cycle to roll out a plan. Now I'm going to turn it over to the second portion of our session today, where we'll be talking about some lessons learned from the field when it comes to implementing social determinants of health screening in different settings. Um, this portion of the session will be led by Catherine Zapik, Senior Co Consulting Manager at HQI. Catherine manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Richmond Accountable Health Community, ensuring quality and equitable screening and navigation services and hands-on support for participating partners, including health systems, FQHCs, and mental health providers. Catherine has experience as a social worker in an ambulatory care setting, where she has helped providers understand the value of addressing social drivers to impact healthcare outcomes. And I'll turn it over to Catherine. 
Thanks, Tammy. Um, so I'm just going to spend a little time giving you a brief background of the AHC model and then talk about our lessons learned from our time participating on that model. So, Tammy, next slide, please. Okay, so if you are not familiar with the AHC model, um, it is a model test funded through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And back when this all started back in May 2017, social determinants was this brand new thing that CMS wanted to see if, you know, if we do something about this, will this make a difference? Um, so ultimately, they wanted us to test if we systematically identify and address health related social, social needs among Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, will this somehow impact healthcare quality, utilization, and cost? Uh, specifically, they were looking at will this reduce ED? visits or readmissions, unnecessary use of services, lower cost, um, and then also, you know, improve the provider and patient experience. So a, uh, HQI was chosen to be one of the 30 AHC models from across the country, and our model was implemented in Richmond, Virginia, where we, uh, we uh, focused our efforts on beneficiaries residing in Richmond City and then three surrounding counties. So we locally, we called ourselves RVA Community Care, since accountable health communities doesn't really roll off the tongue, but um, we spent five of the six years screening and navigating beneficiaries um, and learning just a lot of lessons along the way. Next slide, please. Because um, HQI is a quality improvement organization and not a direct patient service provider, uh, we partnered with 10 different entities uh, to screen their patients or help them in their efforts to screen their patients. So notably two health systems, uh, we worked with screened both inpatient and outpatient. And then we had we screened at outpatient and other capacities as well. Um, as you will see as part of our, our, our convening here, um, we also worked with community service providers to learn more about their resources and help bridge that gap between healthcare and the social service sector to make sure we had a smooth transition between those we screened and then referred elsewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, with C with the CMS rules, they talk about making plans to link to community based organizations, and this is critical. You can't just screen in a vacuum and then send people out without knowing where you're sending to them, where you're sending them for resources, and making sure those resources are solid, that they actually the patient may actually be eligible for those resources, um, and then just building that community to make sure you can work together to help bridge gaps uh, when it comes to lack of resources, um, and then ultimately hopefully you know, get data and some um, efforts you can partner together to advocate for maybe changing your community at the local level or, you know, up the line. Um, we also engage our state Medicaid agency since they are responsible for overseeing the contract with the Med Medicaid managed care organizations and incorporating any social determinant of health um, programs. And then also we had an advisory board that helped us uh, kind of, you know, navigate our efforts uh, look at uh, gaps in our community and ultimately um, help us with any strategic decisions we made during the model. Next slide, please. So CMS had us screen. We used the AHC screening tool because we were required to, um, but we screened for the five core needs listed on the left, which may look very familiar to you. Um, we were given the option to screen for additional needs, but we chose to stick to the five core needs. So we had adequate resources to, to fulfill any, any um, referrals we needed to do, as well as survey fatigue. You know, when you're asking about five different needs, the interpersonal safety question itself has four questions in it. Food has two, two questions. So we wanted to make sure that we were not overwhelming uh, beneficiaries we were screening with questions. And then also the screener had adequate time to ask all these questions. Um, financial strain and employment are drivers for at least four of the five needs. Um, so those topics would come up when we screen, but we were not formally tracking um, those needs, but we would provide and resources if, if people needed them. Next, next slide. So our workflow for AHC, I will say that uh, I'd say half of it, the bottom half is related to what you'll be required to do for the screening for social drivers measure. So what CMS really wanted to find out is if we somehow really focus efforts on this high risk population, which I'll get to a moment in a moment, will that somehow impact claims data after the intervention of that, uh, the, the screening and, and refer, um, 
community service referrals being made. So if we look at the bottom half of this slide, um, once we screened a patient, if they reported having one or more health related social needs, and then one or fewer ED visits, they were considered low risk, mostly because of that ED visit number, and they were given a list of uh, referrals to different resources, and that's where the intervention ended um, as far as AHC went. And so that is what CMS is asking you to do. So you can tune me out for the rest of the slide if you want. Um, however, the other path a patient could take is if they had one or more health-related social needs and then two or more ED visits in the past 12 months, they were considered high risk and qualified uh, for navigation services, which were optional. Um, but this allowed that patient to work with a navigator to help establish what their goals were and their priorities around meeting the needs that they identified. They would get a list of resources and an action plan and that navigator would follow up with them until their needs were resolved or up to 12 months. Um, so if you think about that navigation piece, if you think that that could be beneficial to some patients you have, if you have some like high cost, high need patients you want to focus on, if you want to focus on those who are um, more likely to be readmitted, could you put some extra wraparound services and effort in making sure those patients get connected to resources while you might not be able to connect everybody with additional services or support? So that's just something to think about. But again, that navigation piece is not a requirement. Next slide. So how do you do all this? And so I'll just stop and say that this work looks really easy on paper as far as like, oh, you screen people, you give them resources, you check some boxes, you're good. Um, it's a lot more difficult than that, is this is not something that has been part of your normal workflow. Um, you know, you have social work staff or you might have social work staff or case managers that are used to doing this work, but they may not be, not all patients interact with, with those team members. Um, so Tammy mentioned before having a champion, CMS requires a champion or someone to lead these efforts as his joint commission. It's because you have to have leadership and guidance to make sure these things happen. We had sites that were very successful in their screening efforts because they had leadership from the top and buy-in all the way across the board versus the sites that did not have the same engagement. So that take that very seriously. Um, making sure the clear communication as far as what you're doing, why you're doing it, how it's beneficial, who's responsible for it and what their role is in this process. All of that information up front is very critical to have buy-in. Um, also, identify your motivations among those who are participating. Um, what are you know, their cost savings or penalty avoidance that would motivate some staff to make sure this things happen? Um, patient outcomes. No one gets into healthcare for people to not do well and to suffer. We want people to do better. Um, so thinking about how social needs screening really is a form of preventative care. Um, if you can intervene with a patient who's pre-diabetic, help them identify food and security needs and get them linked to SNAP and get them, I know in Virginia, we have a two for one on uh, fruits and vegetables. If you use your SNAP at certain retailers, so getting them on those fruits and vegetables and, and getting into food pantries that are diabetic friendly, just think how that might change that patient's trajectory long-term. And then lastly, part of your mission, you know, um, when you think of different team members you have, almost half the workforce is Gen Z and millennials, they're mission focused. Uh, they like ethics and clear leadership and uh, inclusion in the, in the workplace and who they're working with. So this also can speak to a mission and motivate your staff too. So next slide, please. So screening workflows. I love to say that this slide just tells you exactly how to do this. Um, I would just say that all of our AHC sites were different on how they approach screening. Um, there's no one size fits all, but I think you can think of it, there's multiple on ramps to get your patients to the same place, which is a completed screening. Um, so knowing that there's more than one point of access to, to be an inpatient um, in a hospital setting. So if you think of your patients that um, have planned stays for surgeries, birth, whatever, um, think about potentially screening them during the registration process, whether it's through the patient portal um, or someone in a call center calling them to do the registration and asking them these questions in advance. And if you don't catch them in advance, then you could catch them potentially at registration on site at the hospital or at the bedside. Um, so there might be multiple screening workflows that you have to catch one patient at some point during their stay. Um, your ED patients may look different as far as their screening. As we know, depending on why you're in the ED, you might not be in a place to complete a screening, and it might have to wait till they are at the bedside to be screened uh, by one of your staff. And then thinking about the different types of patients you 
you see in your hospital setting, whether it's pediatric or adult, your screening approach may need to vary based on that patient site. So it is important to script out for your staff and give them that guidance, but just note that you may have to have different scripts for different patient populations. Then lastly, be flexible. You may think you have the best screening workflow and it's gonna be fantastic. Happens you're not anticipating, you have to rework it. So I will just say, you saw the dates that we've implemented AHC. We were doing really well in February, 2020. We had spent six months really digging into our workflow and we thought we had it all figured out. And then March, 2020 happened and we had to redo everything. So be flexible. Next slide. So I just wanna go over a few different uh, kind of workflow approaches that our sites had and then kind of the challenges that we, we encountered. So. We had some sites that saw the value of screening, but didn't want to assign it immediately to their, their staff because their staff didn't want to overburden them with something extra to do. So they just chose to use interns, um, which student interns can be great, but we all know we've had that great intern and we've all had that intern that was not so great. So there's that inconsistency with those uh, with using students, um, but they're also seasonal. And so we would see um, lower screening rates, winter break, summer break, spring break, fall break exam times. Um, but our biggest lesson learned with interns came when COVID happened and they were the first to leave the clinical environment. So if you're going to screen, you need to make sure that the screening duties are assigned to permanent staff that are going to be part of your usual workflow. I don't know if anyone's using paper screening tools at this point or if you use any paper in your registration process. Um, but if you do, I would just make sure that you have a process to get that information input immediately into your computer system so you don't lose those screening tools um, that are completed or you don't also like not follow up with your patients in a timely manner that actually have needs that need resources. Um, so that's just something to think about if you use paper. Um, I wouldn't suggest it. I'd really suggest entering it real time when the patient's providing the information. If you're going to verbally administer the screening tool, make sure it's part of your, your usual workflow and not something that's kind of tacked on. It's like a you come into registration, then you need to go over there to complete the screening and see that one person, but then they get you know taken away to get blood work and they never come back to the waiting room. Just trying to think of a way that it's built into the workflow and not an extra piece. Um, because we had staff that were just kind of supplemental to check in in an outpatient setting um, that were able to screen patients but for every one person they were screening, we had you know three or four patients walking out the door. Um, so make sure that is part of usual care at a consistent time to capture all patients. Um, and then lastly, if you do any sort of phone screening, we did both pre and post visit phone screening, and we are actually pleasantly surprised on the volume of patients that would answer the phone and complete a screening. Um, so that that is a viable option. I know post visit screening might not be an option for you with the CMS um, rules. However, if you're going to do phone screening, that means you have to have dedicated staff to administer um, and you also need to have adequate patient contact information because otherwise you're not going to reach anybody. All right, next slide. So how can you use current policies and procedures that you have to, to enhance your screening program and also not reinvent the wheel? So when I think specifically about the interpersonal violence questions, yes, those are a heavy lift. You know, how do we want to respond in a sensitive manner and, a, you know, make sure we're meeting the, pe the patient where they are and meet their needs? You probably already have policies in place that about if, if a patient discloses any sort of domestic violence, um, abuse or neglect, um, as well if they're, if they're being trafficked. So think about those policies and then help bridge your screening policy and procedures to how those can kind of interact and kind of smoothly transition um, and, and just use your current policies. Um, you also, if you have case management or social workers um, at your facility, you know, they might be seeing patients at a smaller scale, but talk to them about the services they're currently providing, um, what re relationships they have in the community already, and how that you might be able to scale that up. Um, you don't 
want to, you don't have to totally reinvent the wheel as far as what community resources you're already working with, maybe what uh, resource systems are working with, they may rely on 211 or op Earth that might be adequate in your community, um, or they may be interested in, in using one of those bi-directional referral platforms um, and ready to help onboard other staff. So just, I would lean on that team to see what they're currently doing and then, and see how that can be applicable across your health system. All right, next slide. And then a few other uh, challenges and mitigations I just wanted to point out. Um, if you are going to use a bi-directional platform, those can be integrated into your, your EMR. Um, but you know, there are some facilities that choose not to. And I'll say the AHC data system was not something we could integrate into an EHR. So we had two different data systems. For us, that just require duplicate data, in, which we know can lead to errors, which then leads to trying to dedupe records and figure things out. So I would caution against that. And so if you have a screening tool in your EMR and you can just use that, that meets your needs. I think that is a, a, a low lift, potentially. We know EHRs. However, um, that keeps all the data in one place. And then when you go to stratify your data later, you can have the demographic information and that the health information and your social needs information, hopefully all in one place. Um, providing resources as soon after you screen is, is best. So the patient knows what those resources are for. Um, we know patients get a lot of information when they've been inpatient, um, but making sure they have resources and it doesn't follow too late um, so they can act on them is, is key. Um, and also in case contact information is not accurate, you don't want to just send resources to a black hole and the patient never gets it. This work also is difficult, you know, asking people about their social needs, listening to stories of people, you know, not having adequate housing, um, not being able to access enough food for their families, whatever else it is, hearing it day in and day out can be draining also on top of everything you're already doing in the healthcare system. So I would just want to recognize that and making sure that whatever staff takes on this role um, are given time to process, uh, take breaks, and then seek support as needed. As far as resources in your community, um, making sure that you have adequate resources for what you're screening for is key, and also making sure that those resources can serve a diverse patient population, whether it's um, based on patient's uh, language of choice, physically accessible locations, um, and then also even think about, you know, if you're referring people to food pantries, depending on their the hours they work, you can't just send them to the ones that are open from 1 to 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. You might need options of evenings and weekends as well. And then set your expectations with your patients for the screening program. You may not be able to solve all of their problems and meet all their needs because you're limited to the community resources that exist. So using terms like we may, we may be able to help you with your needs, we, these resources may help meet your needs. There might not be enough resources to help meet their needs. Next slide. So lastly, I just want to mention, you know, how do you know your, your program's working? Um, you know, you have, there's certain metrics you have to report, but if you're tracking your overall number of offers to screen, then you know, you know, how many patients you're actually reaching. Uh, does this vary by unit or by the person who's screening? Um, because if it's not, if people are not consistently being offered the screening, then it could be a training issue. Um, also looking at screening opt-in rates. So offering the screening is one thing, but patients choosing to participate is something else. So if you have low opt-in rates, it may be how the person who's pitching the screening to patients um, is maybe doesn't seem very enticing for them to complete the screening. So that's something else to think about. And then lastly, look at your screen positive rates. You may have an idea of what need in your community looks like, uh, but it might be underreported. So you may be surprised at the level of need. Um, but also if it's way lower than you think it is, um, make sure your staff is not offering the screening in a way that then people might not be you know, as honest with their answers. So. With that, Tammy, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that great information. 
All right, to wrap up our session, we're going to think about um, looking ahead at our next health equity huddle, which will be held on Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, so this, the end of today's session, marks the midway point through our six-month work group. So I'll be sending out an email that includes a brief survey, which is a progress assessment, to just help you think about where you are in your goals since beginning, how you've made progress, um, and if there's anything that HQI can provide to you that would be beneficial um, as you can complete the rest of this work group series. Um, in, an, in our next um, huddle session, we'll be going over this progress assessment um, and talking more about screening, thinking about where you currently are in your screening process um, and what has worked for you and what hasn't. Um, so you'll be receiving two emails from me in the next week. The first one will be just the progress assessment. And then the next email next week will be the link to, this, to today's recording session, um, as well as the slides with all of the resources. And now we have a few minutes left for question and answer. Thank you, Tammy um, and Catherine. That was a really great session. We now have time for some questions. As a reminder, you can use the chat to type in your questions. You're welcome to raise your hand, or I believe you, you even have the ability to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Um, so while you're thinking about that, we did receive a question in the chat box. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I believe this is for Tammy. Has there been a change in terms from social determinants of health to social drivers of health? Yeah, so there is a current push to shift those terms, and it really just comes down to semantics. So what the thinking is, is that social determinants, the word determinant, um, can feel kind of fixed um, and can suggest that a person's health is determined in a specific way versus social drivers kind of suggests um, the opportunity for change over time. Um, so there is a push to start using social drivers instead of social determinants of health. But again, it really does come down to semantics um, and they still are, both terms are still very related to each other, but that is the, the difference there. Thank you. Um, and we, we received another question. What is the time frame for at time of admission? Is it collected within one hour, 24 hours, or any time during the episode of care? Yeah, that's a great question. So for both measures, there is no specific time frame that the data needs to be collected. It can occur at any time during the hospital admission, but it has to be prior to discharge. Thank you. All right, um, let's see. Oh, I just received another question. How frequently should a hospital screen an individual patient? For example, if a patient comes in today, was assessed for the health-related social needs and comes back two months later, does a hospital assess this person again? Yes, so uh, CMS requires that screening sh should occur at each hospital stay. So for patients who are frequently admitted to the hospital, for example, those who may have chronic health conditions, um, the hospital can confirm the current status of any previously reported HRSNs. And you can also inquire about other HRSNs that weren't asked about originally. Um, but it's also noted that if HRSNs have been captured in the, the patient's EHR in an outpatient setting prior to the repeated hospital admission, that information can also be used um, in that reporting. Um, and then also keep in mind that um, although patients should be screened during every admission, only unique patients should be included in the reporting year. So for example, if a patient has those multiple admissions in one year, you wanna use the most recent screening, um, the, rec the most recent information from their HRSN screening to be included in that measure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? That's the last of the questions I've seen in the chat box. Um, would anyone like to ask a question verbally? All right, I believe that's all the questions that we have. 
Um, so don't forget, um, thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to register for the corresponding health equity huddle on May 2nd. That registration info is in the chat. And, and while you're at it, please register for our next age quick office hours, which will be on May 11th, um, which will be about developing a strong hand hygiene culture in your facility. That registration information is also available in the chat. And I believe that is all that we have for today. So thank you again for your time. Um, and, and this concludes today's session. Thank you all again. And please be on the lookout for, uh, for the progress assessment from me. Thank you.